What's up, YouTube? We're going to talk essential metal today. Deep Purple's eighth record, Burn. Testing out a new camera angle, as you can see. I get to sit in my swivel chair now, and you get a more close-up view of this beautiful mug. So I'd say this is a win-win. Tragically, Deep Purple's legacy, especially here in America, has suffered kind of a similar fate that Thin Lizzy's has. Deep Purple, like Thin Lizzy, are a monumentally important and influential band with a real deep catalog full of game-changing releases, yet the general population only recognizes like one album and a couple singles. Sadly, Deep Purple are mostly known for their sixth record, Machine Head, and two singles that are on it, Smoke on the Water and Highway Star, and in Thin Lizzy's case, for comparison's sake, they're mostly known for their Jailbreak record and a few singles like Bad Reputation, the song Jailbreak, and the boys are back in town. And you look at people and you're just like, you can't help people who can't help themselves. Of course, hard rock and metal aficionados know what's up with Deep Purple, and at the end of the day, that's really all that matters. And Purple's eighth record, Burn, is one of numerous reasons that so many people remain so enamored with this band to this day. Burn came out in February of 1974, and it's one of only two records released by what's known as the Mark III lineup of the band. Now, the amount of different lineups Deep Purple has had by now is into the double digits. But Mark III is especially noteworthy because in addition to familiar faces like Richie Blackmore on guitar and Ian Pace on drums and John Lord on keyboards, this lineup featured two future rock and roll icons in Glenn Hughes on bass and vocals and a young David Coverdale on vocals who would go on to form a little band you may have heard of called Whitesnake. Now, of course, we'll get into this later, but having these two powerhouse singers sharing vocal duties is one of the best things about this record. So behind Black Sabbath, of course, Deep Purple are the second most influential band to Heavy Metal's development. The only other band even in the conversation really is Led Zeppelin. Now, the style they play on Burn, the style they play on all their records, it's up for debate whether it's classifiable as metal. You could label it pre-metal or proto-metal if you want. But heavy metal anthropologist Sam Dunn simply refers to Deep Purple as early metal in his infamous heavy metal family tree, and that's what I'm most comfortable with. But what you can't argue is that Burn and Deep Purple's other 70s material in particular is a key pillar in the foundation of heavy metal. So let's get into why, if you are at all interested in metal, you have to listen to Burn. So the record kicks off with one of the most iconic guitar riffs and rock songs of all time, the title track Burn. Chances are, this is the song on here that you've heard somewhere, but if you haven't, this one will essentially sell itself. There's the driving main riff in which Richie Blackmore's guitar and John Lord's keyboards are synced up to give it that enormous sound, which is of course something that a band like Children of Bodom still does to this day. There's also two of the best vocal performances ever being belted out by Glenn Hughes and David Coverdale. The chorus especially is just this borderline operatic wall of vocals coming right at you. And of course, there's the extended guitar solo section. It starts off bluesy, it builds into this furious speed picking motif, which then eventually gives way to a neoclassical arpeggio section, which showcases potentially Richie Blackmore's most important contribution to rock and metal guitar, which is bringing a classical element in. I mean, Ingve Malmsteen might not, no, no, Ingve Malmsteen definitely would not exist if it weren't for stuff like this that Blackmore did. You gotta be really careful with the word perfect, but Burn is a perfect rock song. Everything down to the structure of the song. Like one of the most brilliant things that occurs here is after the second extended solo section, which features some really crazy keyboard solos and stuff, after that long instrumental break, when the main riff returns to just sock you right in the face, it could not be better timing. It yanks the listener back down to rock and roll reality after spending a good chunk of the song in instrumental virtuoso land. In terms of opening tracks to rock albums, it doesn't get much better than Burn. A few songs down the track list from Burn, closing out side one if we're talking vinyl, is the track Sail Away, which is my other personal favorite. The fucking riff in this song is not only the best riff on Burn, it's one of the meanest yet catchiest riffs that the 1970s had to offer, period. It's just got this in-your-face, stomping attitude to it, and rhythmically, in terms of what the drums are doing behind it, 
it's the type of simple but effective groove that unfortunately would be lost in translation a little bit in 80s metal with the arrival of stuff like thrash and death metal and grindcore, but would thankfully be reinstated in the 90s by a band called Pantera. It's riffs like this that immediately come to mind when I think about why I love metal so much. It just compels you to headbang and grit your teeth and just that indescribable charge that a grade A metal riff gives you. Alongside the early Black Sabbath stuff, Richie Blackmore riffs like Sail Away are the fucking prototype. And there's a lot else to love about Sail Away. The vocals in particular are phenomenal. The chorus, the way that Hughes and Coverdale harmonize in the chorus, is a fitting snapshot of why Burn is one of the all-time great rock albums in terms of singing. And Coverdale, the way he delivers the vocals in the verses, in this kind of warm and gentle, inviting tone, definitely foreshadows what would make Whitesnake's power ballads in the 80s so massive. Another crucial contribution Deep Purple made to the development of metal on an album like Burn is that more than any other band, they really jump-started and encouraged the type of intricate musicality that would become key to metal. Like, Burn is a musical showcase at times, with lots of solo spots and interplay between different instruments. The long instrumental section in the up-tempo fifth track, You Fool No One, is one of many, many examples. Richie Blackmore solos for almost a minute and a half, and the entire band locks in for some pretty choppy drum fills from Ian Pace. Another example is the closing instrumental track on here, A200, which is this awesome blend of militant rhythms, a bunch of synth and keyboard sounds that range from exotic to triumphant, and then of course, Richie Blackmore's signature blazing lead guitar licks and wide vibrato. I love the statement this song makes by being the closing track too. It's, it's not only a fun send-off, but it's also like, look, we're not a radio rock band, and the taste that's going to be left in your mouth at the end of this record is us playing our fucking asses off. And that's an ethos that continues in metal to this day. We should definitely also talk about the seventh track on here, Mistreated, which, other than the title track, of course, is the most recognizable and acclaimed song on Burn. It's the only song on here to only feature David Coverdale on vocals, who delivers a real soulful performance. It is almost a ballad of sorts. But... Oddly enough for me, it's actually Glenn Hughes' ridiculously tasteful bass playing that makes the song. Since the guitar playing is fairly simple on this track, especially in the verses, it's Glenn's bass playing that fills in the gaps. He's given a lot of spotlight and a lot of time to shine on this track, whether it's the very first verse or it's that extended harmonized guitar solo in the middle of the song. Glenn Hughes is one of the greatest bass guitar players to ever live, and I'm <laughs> I'm not entertaining any other opinions. And Mistreated is not an anomaly on Burn. Throughout this record, the bass playing is so crucial to these songs, mostly because Glenn performs this delicate balancing act of answering to the guitars, answering to the keyboards, answering to the drums, and all the while generating his own memorable melodic content. Glenn Hughes' performance on Burn is definitive to rock bass guitar. And as I also just briefly mentioned, Mistreated features this weeping, harmonized guitar solo. And of course, the harmonized guitar solo would later be made into a hard rock and metal staple by bands like Thin Lizzy and Iron Maiden. Deep Purple were one of the originators. Actually, probably the best instance of a really great harmonized guitar solo on Burn is actually on the track Lay Down, Stay Down, which is another fantastic cut. I should also quickly mention that we get a taste of metal's roots in blues quite a bit on Burn, especially with the song What's Going On Here, which is a track that heavily features piano and has a swinging rhythm to it. And it's, it's a song like What's Going On Here, along with a song like A200, that really help diversify the album's sound and make it the impressively well-rounded record that it is. Deep Purple may not even qualify as a metal band to some people, but regardless of where you stand on that argument, most of the things that you love about metal are on here in some form or another. I could go on about this thing for hours. How airtight the track list is, how world-class the performances are, how not one band has been able to successfully mimic Deep Purple's unique style during their classic period, and particularly during the Mark III era. But of course, have a listen and decide for yourself. And if you're already familiar, I hope you have fun revisiting this record. As always, thanks so much for watching. Be sure to subscribe, leave a comment, or shoot me a message so we can continue to talk music. And I'll see you guys soon.